Muchas gracias. Even though my Spanish is not very good, I could tell a little bit about what uh, the introduction, and I could tell that my mother would be very proud of what she just heard. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that we've done uh, both at the University of Pittsburgh and around the world in, in medical education. I assure you I am a gastroenterologist. I do um, endoscopy and I have a small clinical practice, uh, but most of my work is in education and specifically the application of technology for education. I do want to uh, make a special thanks to Maria Teresa Galliano for the very kind invitation uh, to share this with you. So I'd like to uh, first disclose that I do have a, a relationship with a company that sells uh, software for medical simulation, uh, but we will not be mentioning that software today. Um, the, this slide here is just there to remind us that we are all teachers and that whether or not we're teaching our children how to ride a bicycle or we're teaching our GI fellows and our trainees how to do a safe and efficient endoscopy, it's our job every day to be working with patients, with colleagues, with our trainees to help them become experts. So I'd like to focus initially on what it means to be an expert. What is the difference between being a novice and an expert at something, specifically uh, gastroenterology? And how might that um, affect how we train our students? Because we are realizing that the students in 2013 and beyond are very different from the way you and I uh, were when we were students, when we didn't have the technology available that we do now. And so what do we do specifically as teachers to be ready for and to be expert at creating uh, experts in gastroenterology. So one of the experts that I always think about is Joshua Bell. He's a violinist and if you've had the opportunity to hear him, you'll realize that he is far beyond the capability of most violinists and is really one of the true experts. I used to play his music at this point in the presentation but I would get so emotional and choked up because it's so beautiful. Half the audience would be in tears because it's so fabulous. If you ever have the chance, uh, fortunately he comes to Pittsburgh every year and we get to hear him. Uh, but this is an example of another type of expert. Does anybody recognize this scene? Yeah, yes, Mir the miracle on the Hudson. Uh, so this was seen all over the world. And I think the pilot, uh, Mr. Sully Sullenberg, or Captain Sullenberg, is one of the best examples of what an expert is. Because it isn't just one thing that made him able to land this plane safely and save every single life uh, this day. It's a combination of things. It's his knowledge. He had vast knowledge of aerodynamics and aircraft structure. He'd been a teacher for many decades. Um, and he had also spent much time training on simulators. But come to find out there's no simulator, at least prior to this event, that simulated the loss of both engines over water. In fact, it was assumed that if both engines were lost on a commercial aircraft, you are definitely going to crash and everybody is definitely going to die. There's no use even practicing that scenario. I can assure you now that this is part of the standard training and uh, <clears throat> Captain Sullenberg is a big part of that. But the other part that he had was years and years of practice. And I make this point because this is the only way a true expert is able to come up with a solution to a problem that perhaps nobody has even imagined. And by combining these techniques and combining these skills, um, that's what really defines an expert. There's been a lot of study about expertise, not just in, G in uh, gastroenterology, and, but in other fields, um, also violinists that you'll hear about in a minute. And, um, but uh, Anders Ericsson did a study where he combined um, some previous work done by others and looked specifically at physicians in the emergency room and looked at how did we de define who an expert is? How do we figure out who's the best of the best in that emergency room? And it, was it the amount and quality of education, what school he went to? Was it his total knowledge of gastroenterology and how well he scored on exams? 
Was it the number of years of experience or perhaps reputation? If you uh, were to poll his colleagues in the emergency room and others uh, outside of the institution, they would say reputation more than anything is what defines an expert. But come to find out, when you look at these as independent variables, none of them really have, uh, uh, really define true performance and true expertise. If you asked um, a, an education specialist, and many of us in, in education and, and, and know Bloom's uh, taxonomy of cognitive skills, and it's this theory that we all start out as novices with uh, knowledge acquisition and starting to understand knowledge, kind of what happens in medical school as you begin to learn the basics of medicine and uh, the human body. As you go up on the pyramid, uh, you learn how to apply that knowledge how to analyze a problem and pull out knowledge and concepts that you've learned before to find a solution. And as you become more and more expert, you're able to do things like Captain Sullenberg did and synthesize various pieces of information, knowledge, uh, maybe some uh, practice and experience and put it together to solve a new problem. And at the very highest point is the ability, ability to come up with an evaluation that distinguishes an expert for an, from a novice. And it's this upper level that most of us in this room, if you're educators, deal with, and it's that taking a novice from the application level up to the ability to analyze problems and synthesize in them, and this is where training and practice come into being. So back to the violinist for a moment, and back to Erickson. So Erickson did a fascinating study that he published in 1993 looking at what really does make an expert violinist. Why is Joshua Bell so much better than the others? And this graph has three different, you know, four different groups displayed on it. Up in the upper left is, or uh, pardon me, the upper right is where the absolute experts, the Joshua Bells and his uh, other uh, experts that are the best violinists in the world reside. The other lines represent the professionals, and you'll notice that the best of the best violinists start out uh, in the, at a young age clearly a little better than the professionals, but eventually they meet up near the top. If you take violinists who are very good, they uh, don't reach quite the height, and if you take the teachers, they're down here. So what's the difference between these three groups? Well, if we look over here on the left side, it really comes down to the number of hours of practice. The more practice, the better you become. And he really showed that given a, a set of uh, musicians that start off at about the same level, the amount of practice is one of the factors that really separates the, the, the best from the very best. Now that's just along the psychomotor skill uh, uh, realm. We also should look at other um, uh, ways of looking at expertise versus novice. There's been a number of studies at looking at how physicians are uh, manage patients and solve problems differently whether you're an expert or a novice. Novices tend to, and as this example, we'll use a, a white belt in uh, karate, but novice physicians tend to take a history, do a physical exam. They may order specific diagnostic tests based on a suspicion of a certain uh, list of possible diagnoses, do another test and another test and another test, and then finally make a decision where they're working systematically through each possible diagnosis, analyzing and thinking conceptually about each one. And that's what, how we teach our students and our trainees to manage, and, and, uh, manage patients and solve clinical problems. Well, come to find out, experts don't do it quite that way. So those of us in the audience who are a little bit older, sorry, um, we tend to skip around a little bit more. Might do a history and a physical examination, but based on our assumption about what the most likely diagnosis is or the two or three things, we'll go ahead and do one test to confirm whether or not we're right and often be able to make a decision about a patient's diagnosis without having to do all these intervening tests, mainly through pattern recognition. Most of us have seen the same thing in similar ways before and need one or two confirmatory tests to uh, assure us that we have the right diagnosis. If we're not right, if that confirmatory diagnosis doesn't support 
our assumption, then we may go back and analyze things and go back to more of the novice's method of analyzing and conceptually looking at the problem rather than leapfrogging ahead to a decision. Now this has advantages and disadvantages. If you look at uh, how novices solve problems, they rely on conceptual knowledge. They engage in a lot of deep critical thinking around each problem and use multiple analyses of each hypothesis. It is a little bit slower and it is dependent on the lower cognitive skills. So you need to have good knowledge and good conceptual uh, knowledge in order to do well as a novice early in your career. Experts, on the other hand, tend to recognize patterns or what's called disease scripts. We have so much experience, so, much, um, uh, inter so many encounters with similar patients that our brain starts to put those together in these disease scripts and our brain right away locks in on a diagnosis of, oh, this patient has Crohn's disease because she's young and she's got right lower quadrant pain and she's got abdominal pain and it's been coming on, off and on for many years and she has a family history of Crohn's disease. All those things immediately lock us into a diagnosis of possible Crohn's disease. We do a colonoscopy to confirm and uh, assure ourselves that we have the right diagnosis. If we do an examination and perhaps th there is no evidence of Crohn's disease, then we might revert back to getting more information, further testing, thinking more deeply and not just assuming and leaping to a diagnosis. This works very well, it's faster, it's more efficient, we're right most of the time, but it is also the source of many medical errors where you tend to, the more experience you get, you tend to ignore pieces of information, pieces of data that just don't fit the hypothesis that you think this patient has. The other disadvantage of becoming experienced uh, has also been looked at in violinists, another study by Erickson, looked and said, that, you know, when you start practicing, it, be, learning the violin, it takes about 10 years to really get up into a, a, a good, uh, to become a good violinist, and you've got about 20 years or, or more of being a very good violinist, and then it starts to taper off uh, after perhaps you're just, uh, your motor skills as you become older are slightly slower, and for a violinist, it starts affecting his or her performance. Well, in gastroenterologists, the same thing happens. We start later, and over 10 years, we become very good. This is in our training in our early years. And we peak probably around 35, 45, and I'm getting into this little curve here. <laughs> Hard to admit that, but um, thankfully, we tend to compensate. So maybe my, my motor skills are starting to diminish slightly. However, my experience and my knowledge has expanded somewhat, so I probably got a few more good years, but think about that when you uh, get your screening colonoscopies done by your colleagues. Uh, you may not want to pick your oldest partner to do your colonoscopy. So what do we do with this information? What do we do with this science that Erickson has helped us with and many other cognitive scientists and people who really look objectively at how people learn both cognitively and, and psychomotor skills? Well, he says, we, as teachers, we should um, re realize that superior performance requires the acquisition of complex integrated systems of representations of, for execution, monitoring, planning, and analysis of performance. That sounds very complicated, but it really isn't. A combination of activities that we would do as, a, as educators is engage our students and our trainees in deliberate practice. A lot of this can be done with simulation. We're already doing much of that uh, at the bedside when we are teaching endoscopic procedures where we're allowing the learner to practice, make mistakes, get advice, adjust his or her uh, uh, technique, as you go along. But it's also important to monitor skill development, and I'm not sure we do this as well as we could. Are we tracking and somehow quantifying and providing reports back to the students as, as uh, how their sc endoscopic skills are progressing, and are we doing frequent enough assessment of their knowledge and their uh, cognitive skills? In addition, and what's um, recommended to further our ability to, tra tra to uh, train GI fellows and, and um, experts in medicine is to individualize the training for each student. Now you know that when you stand next to a student who's just learning how to do a colonoscopy, uh, one trainee 
may have good motor skills and good control of the scope, the next one, the next day, may be fumbling around quite a bit and you have to spend more time just teaching his or her which dial is up and which dial is down. So we already individualize fairly well, but we maybe don't do it so much in more of the, the cognitive uh, and knowledge lessons that we give them, such as lectures and, and um, uh, small group sessions. And we should think about how we can increase the complexity and the control um, of how much we let a student do as he or she progresses along in his training. And that we should be tracking their performance and then um, having some way to know whether uh, the, a student is, is progressing adequately or not. We're doing this at the University of Pittsburgh by each, each trainee keeping his or her own electronic portfolio where he tracks the number of procedures he's done, the quality of them, the, the evaluations and feedback that he or she has received and can meet every six months with our training director to understand whether the progress is adequate and what areas may need additional work. This is starting to sound a lot more like coaching and less like lecturing and traditional teaching. And because our students are different and uh, pretty much everybody that's in my training program started out life like this and playing video games, we know that this group of students is, uh, are often referred to as millennials have a lot more familiarity with the internet, with technology, with, have always had computers most of their lives and been connected to the internet, tend to travel and socialize more, and are constantly connected to each other. And we've got to move to that type of model with our teaching. So instead of transmitting knowledge only and um, with, through curriculum and lectures and books and journals, our students are more adept to learning from different faculty, different experts, not just at your institution, but around the world, um, learning from other outside resources like YouTube um, and uh, Wikipedia and other sources, some good, some bad, but this is the reality of what our students are doing. So I suggest three strategies, and in the second talk, I'll go into more specifics as to what uh, you can do to adapt to new students and adapt to uh, what we know now about uh, training experts. One is for knowledge acquisition, focus more on online learning modules and small group activities, perhaps less on lecture. For cognitive skill development, have uh, students work still at the bedside, making decisions about, um, about the patients that you see on rounds, but also using simulated patients, giving them a controlled environment to, to interact and make cognitive uh, skill decisions. And then engage the students in deliberate practice um, by um, creating opportunities both at the bedside when you're scoping with trainees but also using simulation which we'll go into in the next session. So moving more from, away from lectures, more towards coaching, more like uh, Tiger Woods coach here, Bruce Harmon, where, who's paying attention to everything he's doing and gradually increasing his, uh, uh, his skills uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias.